In 2015, a killer whale surfaced beside a research boat off the coast of British Columbia. It wasn't threatening, it wasn't curious. It had something in its mouth, a bird, dead. The orca floated up, paused, and released the body near the hull. Then it waited. That's not normal behavior, and it wasn't a one-off. Over the next several years, scientists began recording strange patterns. Wild orcas in different parts of the world, completely separate pods, started bringing prey to humans. Divers, researchers, boaters. No aggression, no signs of hunting, just slow approaches and deliberate deliveries. Sometimes fish, sometimes rays, once a seal. And then they'd wait, as if expecting a response. At first, scientists dismissed it. Isolated incidents, misinterpretations, a scavenger's behavior, maybe. But then came the pattern. Multiple orcas, multiple regions, different pods, same behavior. Over 30 verified cases across four oceans. No one had ever seen this kind of behavior before. Not from orcas, not from any wild predator. It raised a question no one expected to ask. Are orcas trying to feed us? And if so, why? To get anywhere near an answer, you need to understand how unusual this is. As we know, orcas, or killer whales, are apex predators, top of the food chain. They're highly intelligent, socially complex, and culturally diverse. What they're not known for is sharing food casually with other species. In the wild, animals don't share without purpose meaning it's generally tied to reproductive strategy, survival, or manipulation. Yet what orcas were doing didn't match any known category. They were just sharing with humans, with no obvious motive. Essentially, they were gifting. Marine biologist Jared Towers was among the first to take the reports seriously. He witnessed the bird incident firsthand. It wasn't a fluke. The orca's behavior was intentional. It came up slowly, made eye contact, released the prey, then held position. When no one reacted, it came back later. Another orca did the same. Two gifts, no transaction. Was this the inner workings of social altruism? That was the moment researchers started digging. They began cataloging other incidents. In New Zealand, a juvenile orca swam up to a diver several times, each time with a stingray draped over its head. It would push closer, drop the stingray in front of the diver, and hover. When the human didn't react, the orca retrieved it and tried again. Another incident off Patagonia involved a large male orca surfacing beside a small boat with a squid in its mouth. It slowly opened its jaw and released the squid onto the side of the boat. Then it backed away and watched. In Norway, a pod approached a photographer and presented what looked like a dead seabird. The group circled quietly after the drop, watching. The event repeated on three separate dives. And off the coast of California, an orca surfaced behind a paddle border and nudged a freshly killed fish toward the board. The paddler didn't notice until later, reviewing drone footage. In nearly every case, the orcas weren't just dropping food and leaving. They were waiting, watching, sometimes repeating the gesture, Almost all the interactions followed the same pattern. Approach, deliver, observe. The consistency caught the attention of researchers. A recent peer-reviewed study compiled 34 verified cases of this exact behavior. Multiple different regions, different pods, different species of prey, but always directed at humans. Some tried to explain it as play behavior. Juvenile orcas are known to interact with floating kelp, ice chunks, and even dead fish. But this wasn't play, these were full kills, and they were being delivered directly to a target, repeatedly. Others thought it might be misplaced social behavior. In orca pods, sharing prey is normal, especially between family members. A mother will share with her calf. Pod members will pass food as a bonding gesture. It's tightly tied to alliance and trust. So what happens when a highly social predator starts treating humans like family? That's where things got uncomfortable, because if these orcas were offering snacks as a form of social bonding, then we weren't just observing them. We were becoming part of their relationship structure. Towers called it prospective sociality. The idea that orcas might be extending a social ritual, food sharing, 
to a species they're curious about, not because we trained them to, not because we fed them first, but because they were assessing us. One event raised the stakes even more. A young male orca offered a fish to a diver, then circled back when the diver didn't take it. On the second pass, the orca dropped the fish closer, within arm's reach. When the diver remained still, the orca lifted the fish again and tried a third time. Only after the diver still didn't react did the orca finally eat the fish itself and swim off. In seven of the documented events, orcas repeated the offering more than once. That's persistence. That's problem solving. And in most cases, the orcas appeared to be observing the human response with focused attention. This was no accident. And then something else showed up in the data. The offerings weren't always food the orca would typically eat. One individual in the Eastern Pacific presented a jellyfish, another offered seaweed. These items had no nutritional value to the orca, but they were still delivered, which opens up an unsettling possibility. What if these weren't gifts? What if they were tests? The idea that orcas are experimenting with human interaction isn't new, but food sharing crosses a line. It's usually reserved for kin. It's emotionally loaded. When a wild animal begins to share with you, it's assigning you a role. It also raises questions about memory. Orcas are known to recognize individual humans. Some will follow specific boats across seasons. There are documented cases of the same orca appearing year after year at the same research site. So if they remember us, and they're testing us, what's the end goal? That's where scientists hit a wall. There's no direct evidence explaining the motive. No pattern that clarifies the payoff. The orcas aren't getting fed. They're not being trained. They're initiating contact, offering prey, then leaving. It's not bribery. It's not begging. It's something else. And here's where things get even stranger, because this isn't the only species doing it. In 2006, National Geographic photographer Paul Nicklin dropped into the freezing waters off Antarctica. His goal was to photograph leopard seals, one of the most formidable predators in the Southern Ocean. But what happened next broke every rule. A massive female leopard seal approached Nicklin, mouth open, not in attack, but in presentation. Clenched in her jaws was a penguin, still alive. Then she released it in front of him. When Nicklin didn't react, she swam off and returned with another. This time it was dead. She pushed it toward Nicklin, watching intently. Then she left and returned with another. Over the course of several days, she brought him a series of penguins, first alive, then injured, then dead, then pre-chewed. It was like a tutorial. She wasn't threatening him, she was trying to feed him, or teach him to hunt, or maybe both. She recognized him as a clumsy predator. She understood on some level he was like her, but completely incapable. And yet the burning question still remained. Why? National Geographic published the full account. It's one of the most bizarre and well-documented examples of interspecies behavior ever recorded. And that interaction reshaped how marine biologists viewed predator intelligence. Because it wasn't about food. It was about assessment, identification, a kind of interspecies empathy, or at least recognition. And suddenly, the orca behavior started to make more sense. The leopard seal misread Nicklin as a struggling predator, and instead of attacking, she tried to help. That much is clear. But she also adjusted her behavior based on his reaction. She escalated. She adapted. She appeared to draw conclusions. So if a leopard seal could misidentify a human as a hopeless hunter, maybe orcas were doing the same. But more than that, Maybe they weren't misidentifying at all. Maybe they knew exactly what humans were. Not prey, not threats, just strange, upright creatures floating awkwardly at the surface. And they're just seeing what we'll do when handed the kill. We might be looking at something bigger than gifting, something more strategic, something targeted. But there's one more detail scientists couldn't ignore. In almost every orca encounter where prey was offered, the human didn't reciprocate. No food was given back. No touch, no interaction beyond watching. And yet, some orcas returned later. Same location, same individual, 
another offering, which rules out short-term reward as a motivator. The orcas weren't getting anything from us, not even acknowledgement in most cases, but they still repeated the behavior. That's not conditioning, that's intent. And it deepens the mystery. One hypothesis is that orcas are repurposing a behavior that normally reinforces pod relationships, using it to probe us, not out of need, not out of fear, but pure curiosity. Testing what we are, what we understand, how we respond, not unlike how a child might hand a toy to a stranger and watch their reaction. But there's a problem with that theory. These aren't juveniles. In several of the recorded incidents, the killer whales making the offering were adult males and females, well past the age of experimentation. Some were confirmed matriarchs, leaders of their pod. That makes the behavior harder to explain. It's not just youthful play or misdirected instinct. And then there's the geographic spread. The behavior has been documented in at least four different regions, the North Pacific, the North Atlantic, the Southern Ocean near New Zealand, and off the Patagonian coast. Different pods, different prey, same interaction. Which suggests this wasn't isolated innovation. It's something that multiple pods either learned independently or shared. That brings up an important point. Orcas don't just pass on vocalizations or hunting strategies. They pass down culture, regional hunting methods, vocal dialects, even migration routes are all taught, not hard-coded. Some pods intentionally strand themselves on beaches to catch seals. Others use kelp to bait stingrays. In Norway, some have been observed using bubbles to trap herring. In the Pacific Northwest, they don't do any of that. Different problems, different solutions. So if orcas are treating food gifting as a meaningful behavior and it's spreading, it might be part of a new cultural pattern. And that's what worries some researchers, because cultural patterns aren't always friendly. Just look at what's happening off the coast of Spain. In 2020, yachts in the Strait of Gibraltar began reporting strange encounters with orcas. At first, the whales followed them. Then they began bumping the boats, then targeting the rudders. Boats were disabled, crews had to be rescued. Damage estimates soared. People started calling them attacks. By 2023, over 500 incidents had been logged. In nearly every case, the whales went for the steering mechanism, systematically dismantling it. And it wasn't random. It appeared taught, shared, a behavior spreading from pod to pod. Same species, same intelligence, very different approach. So now the question isn't just why are orcas feeding humans, it's also why are others attacking boats? And those two behaviors, gift giving and destruction, might be more closely related than they seem. Both are forms of targeted interaction. Both involve assessing another species, watching what they do, adjusting strategy. Some pods may view us as neutral or potentially cooperative. Others may see boats as threats to be removed. This is what makes orcas different from nearly any other marine species we know. Their behavior isn't static. It adapts, it spreads, it evolves, not in generations, but within a decade sometimes even less. And the way we respond matters. Researchers who regularly engage with orcas, like those in New Zealand or the Pacific Northwest, report different behavior than seen in places where orcas are harassed, chased, or hunted. In the regions where food sharing has occurred, there's been no aggression, no attacks, just curiosity, proximity, and offerings. It's starting to look like orcas are keeping track, not just of individual people, but of entire human behaviors, as if they're building profiles, mapping trust, deciding who gets ignored and who gets approached. And that takes us back to the gifts. What if the prey being offered isn't the point? What if it's the interaction, the reaction? The orca hands you a fish, not to feed you, but to see how you handle being given something from an apex predator. Not as prey, not as a competition, but as a peer. There's no guarantee we'll ever fully understand their motives, but we do know this. It's not random, it's not universal, and it's not without precedent. Apex predators sometimes do strange things when they recognize intelligence in another species. 
In 2009, a study documented a bottlenose dolphin off Australia's coast that began gifting marine sponges to snorkelers. Repeatedly, no training, no food reward, just approach, offer, wait. And it wasn't an isolated incident. Others began copying the behavior. In Yellowstone, there are documented cases of wolves not attacking lone hikers, despite being in perfect range, and instead following them for miles without engagement. Ethologists still argue over why. It's tempting to romanticize these moments, to call them connection or understanding or interspecies respect. But the truth is, we don't know. These behaviors might mean something profound or nothing at all. We only know they're happening. And when it comes to orcas, the evidence is growing. They're not just watching us, they're studying us. Some offer gifts, some chase boats, some ignore us entirely. But all of it points to a species that isn't reacting instinctively. It's making decisions. That makes orcas not just intelligent, but strategic. And when a strategic predator starts handing you fish, you might want to pay attention. Because whether it's curiosity, testing, the start of a new behavioral loop, or a deeper kind of recognition, the message is the same. They are aware of us. The only question left is what they're planning to do with that awareness.